I am going to give you a little bit of a um, intro to Ginny. Ginny Apple is a pretty special person. She's been doing this with us for about two years now. She used to do it in person, but now she's become the Zoom virtual animal person in our lives here at the library and around us. Well, Jenny is a resident of Bark Hampstead and is a master wildlife conservationist with the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Her house is within the People State Forest where she observes very large populations of black bears and she supplies pictures and different data and field notes to the DEEP biologist. As a master wife, uh, pardon me, as a master life uh, hmm, start over. As a master wildlife conservationist, she also serves as the bald eagle interpreter of the Chapag Dam Eagle Viewing Area and the Essex Steam Trains Eagle Flyer. Just to keep herself busy on other fronts, Jenny has a side business. She has it's called Murder Without Pain, where she writes murder mysteries and has games based on historical subjects and runs them at country inns corporate parties and fundraisers. And with that, I am going to uh, block myself out here and let Jenny have her way and tell us all about the mighty moose. Thank you. Hold Jenny, on. I can't hear you. Okay. There we go. Uh, hey, welcome to everybody. I guess everybody wants to be warm today because it's uh, kind of cold out, but not windy. If it's not windy, I tend to go up, try to get out and about with my friend Susan, who happens to be here. And I see my friend Ron and a couple other friends of Lisa. And so welcome to everybody. And I see a few familiar faces and names from the Hunt Library group. Uh, I think it's a great library. They've really uh, done a terrific job through COVID. Um, what a challenge that's been for teachers and, and libraries, but you guys are very lucky to have the group, Erica and Garth at, uh, at the library, and I just wanted to say that. So uh, we're going to talk about the moose today, and uh, you do have some moose in your area, uh, and uh, I will tell you all about that. So I'm going to get rid of my face and share my PowerPoint, because you don't need to see me, you'd rather see the mighty moose. Always oh, takes me a minute. All right. So there are moose in them are woods. I have to say, you know, we have those old sayings. Uh, uh, they quite are quite magnificent creatures. Uh, I remember when I saw my first one in person. I was a, sorry, I was a youngster. Uh, my parents, growing up in Texas, my parents or my grandparents thought nothing of going thousands of miles uh, on a one week vacation. <laughs> So I saw my first moose in, uh, uh, I think in Colorado, I can't remember exactly, but I really thought it was like a dinosaur or something. Uh, I thought the same thing when I saw a great blue heron flying overhead, you know, they're, they're very uh, prehistoric looking critters and very fabulous critters in my opinion. Um, Moose are the largest members of the deer family, uh, the young ones. They weigh as much as 15 to 1600 pounds. They can be uh, five to seven feet. Um, this does not include their raised head or antlers. So it's safe to say that the majority of moose tower over all non-basketball players. <laughs> there might be some of those seven footers that maybe they'd be uh, cheek to cheek. Um, although its appearance is very different from other deer, a moose is a deer. Uh, not only that, as I said, they are the largest member of the deer family and one of the largest deer of all time. And it is the largest land animal in Europe and North America. Uh, they're ungulates, which are hoofed mammals, and they are identified by their long rounded snouts, very distinctive, almost camel-like. Uh, they have very huge flattened antlers, uh, massive bodies. Uh, they live in the Northern United States, Canada and Europe and parts of Asia. Here they're called moose. In Europe, they call them the Eurasian elk. Uh, moose comes from an Algonquin uh, term that means twig eater. 
And if you look for sign in the forest, you can always see where the moose have been snapping off those twigs or browsing on them. The males are called moose, females, cows, and the young moose of either sex are called a calf. Uh, the plural of moose is moose, not meese. So uh, let's don't get that one wrong. We always like to have the proper terms here. Uh, it's the same as the singular in many words that come from Native American languages. The same is true of many wildlife names like deer, mink, and grouse. Here's a comparison of moose, elk in our country, caribou, and deer. So you can see there's quite, quite a difference in the size there. Um, the moose are large ungulates. That, again, that's hoofed mammals. That's U-N-G-U-L-A-T-E, nice word, has a good ring to it. Again, they have those long snouts, uh, very distinctive looking, uh, very dark here. Uh, they are arguably the most novel of all North American animals, if for no other reason, because they have a strange appearance. Uh, whereas deer and elk are kind of handsome critters, uh, rams are majestic and bears, to me and a lot of people, awe-inspiring. Moose seem to suggest that the creator had a strange sense of humor. They have horse legs, bison shoulders, a camel's face, and a throat beard that would have made Henry David Thoreau even envious, I think. And even though their horns are weird, uh, looking less like antlers as we traditionally know them and more like giant butterfly wings or palmated wooden bowls. Uh, but those we'll talk about are huge and they can weigh you know, up to over 50 pounds. Uh, so imagine carrying that on your head. Uh, but to me, again, as I said, I think the moose looks prehistoric and that is misleading because they're actually a relatively modern creature, although in Europe and Asia, evidence of moose dated back to the Pleistocene period. Uh, they came to the Americas um, via the Siberia-Alaska land bridge, and most researchers think that significant moose dispersal in North America only occurred about 10,000 years ago. Compare this to the white-tailed deer, and they've been kicking around the Americas for about 3.5 million years. So the moose is pretty young as those things go. Just to show you kind of an ancient relative of the moose, this is the skeleton of the Irish elk. Uh, there's the Latin term. I took five years of Latin, but I still can't pronounce it. So I'll let you have a go at it. Uh, they ranged across Northern Eurasia from Siberia to Ireland and shed their giant antlers every year. And my friend Jake, who we call the moose man, who goes out and about and finds a lot of moose shed, boy, he would just like probably, you know, faint if he found any of these. But um, this is on display in, uh, at the Smithsonian, so you can see this. As a name, Irish elk is a double misnomer. The animal did thrive in Ireland, but was not exclusively Irish. And it ranged across uh, Western Europe uh, to Siberia for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Here's another, uh, Ancestor of our common moose, this is called the broad fronted moose. Um, it was a large moose like deer of the Holarctic regions of Europe and Asia, and it dated back over 200,000 years ago, but is now extinct. Um, there are eight subspecies of moose in the world. Four of these are several Eurasian species. Um, the uh, European moose, you can see there in the red. Uh, the Siberian or Yakut moose uh, there in the blue, uh, the West Siberian or Usuri moose uh, in the green, and the East Siberian or Kolyma moose uh, there again uh, in the right in the yellow. Uh, so these are the moose in Europe right now. Um, there's about 1.5 million moose in 12 countries over there. China, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Finland, Lithuania, Norway, Manchuria, Poland, Russia, Siberia, Slovakia, and Sweden. Um, in the European part of Russia, the moose was nearly extinct in the 20s, but they began to implement some protections against moose hunting and the population has tripled since then. Here in the U.S., there are four subspecies in North America. Uh, they do inhabit, as you can see, mostly the northern parts of North America. Um, largely, the largest population uh, is in, in Canada and Alaska. 
uh, also North Dakota and Minnesota and Northern Michigan have a high population. Um, in addition to uh, geographical distribution, these subspecies of moose are distinguished by their features such as size and antler characteristics. Um, they're limited to the Rocky Mountains, as you can see, as far south as Colorado and to these eastern states bordering Canada. Uh, and again, they, they are widespread all over uh, Alaska. Um, in general, the North American moose have a more bright uh, color than the European ones, and they have, but they have darker legs. Um, and they're approximately double the weight of the European species on their antlers. Um, they think there's about 750,000 moose in nine provinces and three territories in Canada. Uh, in the U.S., 15 states, uh, approximately 250,000 moose. You're saying, hey, there's, that's a lot of moose. How come I never see them? Well, you got to go out on a cold day like today because right now they're shedding those antlers and you might find some moose shed. And they're also more likely to be seen uh, in the winter and also in from mid-September to October when they're mating here. Uh, so again, magnificent uh, creatures. I think I can say I'll say so I'll say some Americana. I think I'm able to do that. But anyway, the highest density of moose are in Maine, 30,000, although numbers are dwindling a little now and we'll talk about that. Uh, again, they're mahogany brown in color. And uh, this Eastern moose is the smallest of all the subspecies uh, of moose. After moose hunting was forbidden between 1935 and 1980 in Maine, their population of moose increased from 7,000 to about 20,000 in 1990. Uh, that, to me, provides a very good example of how human interaction does sometimes negatively influence uh, populations of wildlife. Um, the, also a very good example of their southerly expansion, which we are about the most southerly that they'll go. That doesn't mean like one might not end up wandering to New Jersey, doubtful, but could happen. Uh, there was no uh, attested report of moose in Connecticut before 1956, even though there were some writings in the early 1900s that some people saw moose. Uh, we estimate the population of our moose, and these are mostly through hunter sightings and public sightings of somewhere around 100, possibly up to 150, although that we think might be uh, you know, a high number since uh, now they are dwindling for a number of reasons we will talk about. It's unclear if there were ever moose native to Connecticut. There, there are no ar archeological deposits of moose uh, and not many mentions of the animal from ethno-historic accounts. If, if they were native, they were very in very low numbers. Um, so that's the new status here right now. Um, there is a growing, there's a moose population of about 15, between 1,500 and 2,000 in Massachusetts, and most of our moose have migrated down from there. Um, so the Northwestern moose uh, is. Uh, mostly exclusively, exclusively in Upper Michigan Peninsula, Minnesota, North Dakota, and surrounding states. Um, the, did I miss the Shiraz? Hold on a second. Uh, the Shiraz moose, then you see they all start with that I'll say, so I'll say, so all moose have that Latin first two terms. Uh, it's found in Glacier National Park and part of the Rockies. It's the smallest of the moose. And it only weighs, oh my gosh, 600 to 800 pounds. So it's a, it doesn't look too small to me. But And then the Northwestern moose, again, is next in size. And it can be upwards of 1,000 pounds. And our giant moose, of course, which is true of a lot of Alaskan animals, uh, it's, uh, the, it's a subspecies of moose that ranges from Alaska to the Western Yukon. Uh, it's the largest North American moose. Uh, it can stand over 6.9 feet at the shoulders, imagine that, and weigh over 1,500 pounds. Uh, the antlers can have a span of up to six feet, from six feet to seven feet. Imagine carrying that on your heads. And female Alaska moose can stand an average of almost six feet at the shoulder and can weigh 1,000 and a half pounds. So a uh, pretty large animal. And I'm sure if you've gone to Alaska, you've seen it. 
The largest moose was shot in the Western Yukon in September 1897, a long time ago for a record. It weighed 1,808 pounds and was 7.6 feet tall at the shoulder. Um, so the Alaska moose, um, along with a moose called the Chukotka moose, matches the extinct Irish elk as the largest deer of all time. Here's some comparisons you can see. So here's the lowly man, and uh, there's the Irish uh, elk, and then the moose, and then our deer. So quite a difference in, in size. Here's their range right now. Um, the green is where the highly more populous uh, numbers of moose per square kilometer. Yep, we have to use kilometers here. That's all I got. And as you see down in little Connecticut, they don't even mark us in. So we do have moose now. So a lot of these data maps we get are kind of out of date. So we just kind of have to deal with it. But uh, as you see, it what, uh, from mid middle Massachusetts over to Western Mass at Orange, that's where their population of moose are. And we have had moose that are in that northern eastern part of Connecticut, not very many, but there have been moose seen there. And uh, then down through northwestern Connecticut with our highest populations, which we'll talk about in Heartland, Norfolk, and Barkhamstead, although we're the probably southernmost part of that. Uh, here's their states uh, by moose population. They, they put the sta states to scale. So you can see Maine comes in second, then Idaho, and then we go New Hampshire, Montana, Vermont, Minnesota. And then we see tiny little Connecticut. Uh, so, but we are in there and we hope to continue to have a moose population if they can overcome the challenges that they face. Uh, here's background history of moose in northern New England. Uh, they expanded south into Massachusetts and Connecticut towards the late 1900s. Um, so it was quite exciting, you know, for the biologists here. Andy Labonte is our head uh, moose biologist. Very exciting for them to, to have the migration down here. Uh, here's cow-calf sightings. And, and generally how you measure a wildlife population is is through you know the offspring and uh, so wait a minute I'm sorry I had to go back one time um, sorry I'm, I miss I think I missed something let me just check no so okay so that that circle up there is heart one so you see those are a lot of moose up there and uh, just below it so you guys are over there I think you had one moose cat sighting at that time. So what they decided to do when they started studying the moose in 1992, they were just taking public sightings and getting numbers and they, they found them in a no, number of towns. Um, so between 1992 and 1999, there were six sightings a year, not very many. And then between 2000 and 2014, there were sightings in 127 different towns. So in 1996, they decided to include sightings by hunters and uh, that raised the numbers up to around 73 moose. And then the projection from that was that the population would grow to 258 moose over a 20 year period. But these numbers are now pretty unlikely here in uh, Connecticut as the numbers are starting to dwindle for a number of reasons, which we will talk about. Uh, so there are population constraints on moose. Are they, are, are they preyed upon? Out west, they are preyed upon grizzlies and, and wolves a lot. Uh, here in the east, they can be preyed upon by coyotes and black bear, but generally that would be on calves or, or moose that are uh, succumbing to ticks, the winter tick or the moose tick, or to the brain worm. So generally speaking, uh, they can live up to their mid-20s, but they are very susceptible to parasites, disease, malnutrition, and in populated areas in Connecticut, collisions with automobiles. Um, in New England, there's really no predators that can take an adult moose down, but out west, as I said, they can. Uh, in New England, there are regulated hunting seasons that have been curtailed a little. They have lotteries in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, no hunting in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, but according to Andy, our moose biologist, the future for it is very grim for the moose population. And the, we'll go into it for those reasons are disease, 
heat stress brought on by global warming, the winter ticks, uh, habitat loss or limited quantity. They love conifers and we don't have a lot of conifers. Uh, competition with deer and deer bring about that brain worm disease that they don't necessarily die from, but the moose do. Uh, so uh, that's some of the concerns. Uh, back in 2007, uh, we had uh, one of our first moose collisions in New Canaan, and that was kind of far afield for a moose. That's on the right. You can't see the moose is off in the, not in the picture right now. But the problem with the moose is it's so tall, you can't see its eye shine. So like, you know, you see a deer in the headlights or other animals, you see them walking along the side of the road, you can see that eye shine, the shine that their eyes emit. Well, moose do have eye shine, but guess what? they're too tall for our headlights to see the shine. So on our dark roads, I always tell y'all, and I know I've told you before, we have to slow down because our roads are dark and we got a lot of critter, critters that are dark and they can be hit. And when a moose, it's so tall, the car and even the fender on a truck, which is about the, even though the truck's high, the fender of a truck's about the same level of a car fender. So it hits the, the moose just below the knees and quite often, the new, moose doesn't land on the, on the hood. It lands on the windshield and oftentimes in the car. So uh, pretty bad. I know if you've been to New Hampshire, they say they have a sign of a moose. And it says hundreds of collisions, which makes me laugh because I hiked all those mountains up there. And I'm thinking, it's thousands and thousands, but the word won't fit on the sign. So they just say hundreds. So I guess they should say each year or something. But but we have had a, a you know moose hit in Connecticut, not in large numbers because they're not out in large numbers. But you certainly don't want to run into one. Uh, so there you go. There's you know very sad, but this is what can happen. Pretty pretty grim. Probably one of the worst animals you can hit. Even though a grizzly is so big, uh, when bears are running, you know they're lower, so you're hitting their shoulders. So they're not flying up over the car like these ungulates with the long legs. Um, historically, as I said, it's kind of unclear if moose were ever native to Connecticut. Uh, we have no archaeological evidence of the moose. Um, they are considered a cold climate species, and they did once range as far south as Pennsylvania, uh, but with New England's transformation from forested to an agrarian landscape during colonial times, they disappeared from the area, like from in other places like Pennsylvania. Uh, but in the 80s, uh, a breeding population started to reestablish itself in Massachusetts. And as I said, they, they estimate they have up to around 1,500 moose. Um, the Connecticut um, Board of Fisheries uh, decided to um, start studying these. And there was an official photograph uh, in 1956. So they have been on the rebound. Um, but the moose did get cachet with one of our founding fathers, uh, a French nobleman, uh, Count uh, Georges Louis Buffon, had an explanation. Uh, he was a great Parisian writer, and though he'd never been to America, he'd read travel accounts, and made notes, and decided that America's flaw was built in deeply environmental. He called this a great swamp, and he he declared that America was mostly a swamp and had only recently lifted itself up out of the sea. It was still drying out, so anything that lived there could not compete with a drier, hardier, more bracing climate in Europe. That's why he claimed American animals and plants were smaller, more fragile, and less diverse. Now, remember, he hadn't been here. His book included uh, uh, comparative tables cobbled together from written accounts. Uh, well, Jefferson was not very happy about this. Um, he, he said there were a lot of moose in North America. And uh, he said, he told Buffon that a reindeer is pitiful next to an American moose. And he recounted that the reindeer could walk under the belly of our moose. So uh, this is a book, it's quite, it's really quite interesting. It's esoteric, but it does have a lot of natural history of America. So we're talking to a library, so I always like to give you some books. Um, in the years after the Revolutionary War, America was viewed by Europeans as a backwater. Excuse me, I gotta take a drink. 
in the winter. And so that's why the Count wrote this book, but Jefferson was quick to, um, <coughs> to uh, refute this. So in this book, uh, the author recreates the origin and evolution of the debates about natural history in America. And uh, he does turn the moose to American history. Excuse me, I'm sorry, in the winter I get like a dry throat. <coughs> okay, as you know, moose are very large animals. They have long, slender, grayish white legs. Again, they can stand well over six feet tall and be up to 1,500 pounds. The females are somewhat smaller. They could weigh up to 1,000 pounds, but on average about 750. Uh, their coats can range from very, very dark, which is why they're so hard uh, to see at night, depending on their age. They do have a molt in the spring. Uh, the male's face is blacker than the female's. Uh, hers is more brown. They both have that skin flap or bell underneath their throat, but the bulls is a lot larger. Uh, on the back of the female, she has a little white patch right near her, her um, ovula, and uh, that's one way to distinguish her. In the back, the males also have, uh, from the knees down, uh, lighter colored legs. Uh, the males also have those impressive antlers, which are shed annually. Again, as I say, they begin to grow in early spring and fully develop by late summer. Uh, they will scrape the velvet off the antlers and rub against trees. Some of these antlers can weigh up to 60 pounds, 30 pounds on each, and spread up to five feet across. Uh, male calves sometimes will get little bitty antlers developing with vel velvet on them. They're called button antlers, and the yearlings usually develop spikes. So like I said, this is a good time to go out to look for uh, moose shed and deer shed. It's very hard to find. My biologist friends have hardly ever found moose shed, but again, since our numbers are small, uh, that's not unusual, but as you can see, they're just very beautiful. Habitat selection is uh, governed with moose and other animals by their forage availability. They inhabit forests, like, like a lot of cover, so they can avoid the heat, and they like uh, in deep snow in winters, and they select these habitats uh, with the best combination of cover and food uh, to use for calving sites. And that's pretty typical of, of most uh, uh, animals. The moose is a herbivore. Um, they can occupy in the same range throughout the year as long as there's enough to feed themselves. Uh, and it depends on the weather. Uh, if it's too hot, they're gonna move more north. Uh, moose that occupy flat terrain will move from habitat with, that has aspen or willow stands in the summer to dense conifer forest in the winter. Um, with their huge size, there comes a huge appetite. Moose are browsers and they'll casually devour 73 pounds of food a day, imagine that, in the summer, and 34 pounds in the winter. They can eat up to 100 pounds of food a day. It's hard to imagine when they're like eating plants, but I guess they're able to do that. They do eat an assortment. They, they'll eat shrubs, woody plants, aquatic vegetation in the winter. Uh, though their diet is a little more restricted, so that's when you'll see them toothing off uh, little twigs of trees. They really particularly, they do like willows and birch and aspen, um, so they'll eat the buds of plants coming out. Uh, they can store up to 100 pounds of food in their stomachs. That's pretty amazing to me. The moose breeding or rutting season begins in September. I remember, I think it was last year or the year before, somewhere near you guys, uh, there were two moose that were fighting in somebody's front yard and they end up getting their antlers hooked. So the biologist has to race out there and uh, help them out. But anyway, at this time of year, the bull's neck swells and, and they don't feed much because they're going out looking for a, a mate. They'll lose some a considerable amount of weight. Uh, and both the bulls and the cows go in search of a mate. So it's not just the bull. Uh, the bulls can breed as yearlings. Uh, but the older bulls, obviously, because they're stronger and bigger and have attitude, um, they usually dominate breeding activities. Uh, the cows usually don't breed until they're about a year and a half old. Uh, during that rut, you'll have all these sparring matches. Uh, you can see these out west in the national parks, pretty common, but not so uh, common here. Uh, this is photos by our DEP photographer, Paul Fusco. 
not in Connecticut, he, he told me, but uh, still a great photo nonetheless. And I'm very happy and all of us that we can use Paul's photos. He's a great photographer and artist as well. Anyway, these matches can be aggressive encounters. Uh, sometimes they result in injury and sometimes even death. I mean, these guys really go at it. Uh, they even make rut pits uh, for use during courtship. They dig them with the front of their hooves and then they mark them by urinating into them. Uh, the cows who are interested, they'll step into the pit and vocalize to call the bull moose. Uh, you'll hear these later, but moose vocalizations include grunts, moans, and whines, and some of them you'd never even know they were a moose. Again, so uh, the mating season does begin uh, here in Connecticut in mid-September, and it goes through October. That's pretty consistent in, in all of New England, um, uh, but uh, probably up north a little sooner. In, in late May or June, following a gestation period of about eight months, cows give birth to a 20 to 25 pound calf. Uh, twins are not uncommon. Uh, the calves are helpless at birth, which is true of infants and most young things. I, I always laugh when they tell you, oh, they're helpless at birth. Well, I'm like, well, yeah, babies are too. <laughs> uh, but they do become more agile after a few days, kind of like our cow calves. Um, they grow very quickly and they will remain with their mother for a year uh, for protection. Uh, some uh, small calves, when they're very young and the mother's not around here in Connecticut, could, could be predated on by um, coyotes or male black bears uh, when they're first coming out from hibernation. <clears throat> this is another photo of Paul's. A female moose or cows, they, as I said, generally have one to two, but here mostly one and it's in May. Um, I think I told you how much they weigh. Uh, she will fight off other things that, that uh, are a threat to her young and uh, moose are pretty ferocious if they decide to fight. They can kick pretty good. Um, they have a strong sense of smell and hearing but they have very poor eyesight. They're nearsighted but that does help them when they're browsing for water plants uh, but their distance sight is not very good. And can they run? They're athletes despite their megalithic stature and gangly appearance. They're very fast runners for their size. When they decide to bolt out of their typical trot, they've been clocked up to 40 miles per hour. You're saying bolt, move over. They can run for 10 miles without stopping. It's an excellent example of a cold tolerant species because their large body size and their long legs and their makes them extremely well adapted to winter as well as their coat. Um, of the northern ungulates, they are perhaps the best ad adapted to cold. Uh, if you'll look at their leg here, moose walking in deep snow, they have a special gait that they use to navigate the depths. Uh, they are also able to use uh, a, that gait. Um, they have this exceptional angle between their long shin bone, which is their tibia, and the metatarsis of the hind leg. So they can kind of, it's like a double jointed movement, but they can move that and that helps them get through that tough snow. They're also excellent swimmers. They can move their heady bodies at about six miles per hour in water. Well, you say that's not too fast, but they can swim neck to neck with Michael Phelps at his fastest speed, which was about six miles per hour. But after a couple of meters, Phelps would be fading in the distance and the moose can keep up that pace for about two hours. Uh, they're born knowing how to swim. Why do they swim? They love to swim and often dive underwater and swim for extended periods of time to stay cool. So that's why in, in, you know, once the spring comes and into the autumn, you'll see moose a lot of times in water because it does cool them down. They can close their nostrils and that gives them the ability to graze underwater. Other animals like beaver can also do this underwater. Their respiration weight slows down when they are in water and that allows them to stay underwater for, for a while. Um, another upshot of spending time in water prolongs their life. And I think a friend of mine is here today and he's a doctor and the reason is, and it's, it's true of humans too, standing around in water all day takes some of the stress off their joints and bones. Think water aerobics or lower impact than running. Uh, which reduces their chances of osteoporosis and arthritis. They can get that as well, animals can. Also just being in a couple feet of water 
discourages predators like wolves and mountain lions from attacking them because it's a lot harder to sneak up on something that's surrounded by water, especially something that large. Uh, these are kind of grim. Moose are dying at an alarming rate uh, throughout of the country, not so much in Alaska or uh, the provinces. They're succumbing to conditions such as brainworm, which is brought on by deer, uh, by large populations of deer, and the deer aren't so susceptible to it, but the moose are. They get tick infestations, uh, which can cover young moose calves, uh, over 100,000 ticks because they mate and they reproduce right on the moose. Uh, bacterial infections from injuries and liver flukes, as well as uh, being hit by cars. Uh, it's pretty grim. Uh, Vermont and New Hampshire have lost 50% of their calves lately to these ticks, these winter ticks, which they totally exist, as I said, on the animal. They, they wait until the bo uh, big body comes by and they attach themselves out there. And Soon the moose starts scratching up against trees, trying to get rid of the ticks, and then it scratches all its fur off in the winter. And uh, when they found the, the young calves or yearlings the next spring, they've had like almost all of their blood sucked out of them by these ticks, which can go, grow to six times their size by eating all of that blood. Uh, there's a study going on now, and I wasn't able to read that much up on it, but they found this fungi that they think will um, help kill these ticks, but it has to be put, uh, put out in certain areas where they know the moose could be, because obviously they can't put it over hundreds of thousands of acres, but that's a hopeful thing that might help uh, with this tick infestation. Um, and also, as I said, the brain worm, we had a, a moose die up in Heartland of brain worm. People saw it for a few days in the same area. It was kind of going in circles and acting really weird, which is typical of what brain worm will do to the moose. And then ultimately it had to be put down and it was sent to Yukon for a necropsy and it did have brain worm. So uh, even though they're large animals, they can be susceptible. Another thing we've had in Connecticut, which is really unusual, if you're hikers, uh, we have a lot of old well holes and uh, foundation holes throughout our forest and the state does try to cover some of them up but people uncover them and we've had uh, more than a few moose that have fallen into these uh, holes and generally speaking they're not able to get them out you know before they die so that's something we never think of but uh, if you have an open well in your uh, in your house uh, I mean in your yard cover it up <laughs> So let's see, I meant to send go forward, hold on, okay. Uh, charging moose can come at you at about, as I said, they can run up to 35 miles per hour. Uh, have we had any moose attacks in Connecticut? No, uh, Andy tells a story of them tranquilizing a moose and they tried to get it to, to you know, they watch them once they come out of the tranq, you know, once the tranquilizer wear wears off and this young moose kept coming into the stream they were trying to keep it away from and it kept coming and coming and coming and finally it, they couldn't get it to go away and uh, finally one of the biologists had to go to the other side and you know be a decoy and the moose followed it out but uh, usually they don't like encounters with people uh, they say the hunters say don't look them in the eye I don't know if that's true or not I was hiking uh, in Baxter State Park one time and we were done hiking for the day and somebody told me, oh, there's, there's a young bull moose over at such and such pond and right at dusk. I said, oh, I'm going to go. And I tried to get my friends. They wouldn't go. So I go running. And this is before cell phones come around the corner and there's the bull moose. And it was way higher than my head. And I looked at it. It looked at me and I just kind of stood still. And luckily it kind of got bored and left. But anyway, uh, males are very territorial and they are irritable during their running season. Uh, so the hunters say that they'll take an aggressive posture if you stare at them. And uh, if they start stomping their feet and huffing and stuff, uh, it's best uh, that you go and because you can't run 35 miles an hour. Uh, if you really feel in danger, uh, get behind a tree. It sounds silly, it kind of sounds sort of like a cartoon, but you can keep going around the tree because it can't get you that way. And then, or you could climb the tree and eventually 
most animals, except for probably grizzlies, get uh, bored and leave. Again, their antlers, quite impressive. As I said, they can weigh up to 60 pounds. Uh, we bet it feels it's pretty funny when they shed the first one, have to walk around lopsided, but they don't tend to shed both their antlers at the same time. Uh, they're uh, pretty incredible. I have friends who's loaned me some of them and, and I can't even believe how big they are. Uh, they do resemble, as you can see, kind of a pair of hands with the palms open and the fingers pointing outwards. Uh, they'll lose their antlers in December and January and start growing a new set in April. Uh, and again, we'll reach full size in June. Uh, these antlers are covered with velvet and it peels off in August. So um, after that, their blood supply to the antlers cut off and then the antlers don't grow anymore. But the antlers have become kind of a symbol of strength and virility intended to impress the, uh, the cows and intimidate the rivals. Uh, again, they're mostly used for fighting for a mate. Uh, and they do come in handy uh, in wolf attacks. A friend of mine who's a biologist out west told me that uh, he had seen uh, a moose attack a, a wolf with the antlers and the wolf eventually ran off. When car and moose fight back fiercely with their front feet and ant antlers, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who we all know is quite a hunter and who called his uh, his political party, the Bull Moose Party. He, he had great respect uh, for a bull moose, so he would often say, I feel as fit as a bull moose. Uh, a single blow from their hooves can kill or cripple a human, a bear, or a wolf. Uh, while on a hunting trip, he was charged by a bull moose. He wrote afterwards, uh, it came at him at a slashing trot, shaking his head, his ears back, his hair on his withers bristling. He shot it when it was about 30 feet off. Uh, describing the encounter with a seven foot female moose, uh, another Colorado rep, Bob Schaefer said, she had a look in her eyes saying, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to kill you. So they can look pretty ferocious. Uh, they tend to feed on willow tips. This is a moose rub here. So you can be out in the woods and you can see this quite distinctive from a deer because look how high up it goes. Uh, I got this last year when I was out with a friend looking for some moose shed, didn't find it, but uh, they do like uh, maples and other trees, bark, twigs. So oftentimes this time of year, you'll see deer brows and moose brows. You'll see little snaps on the branches and you'll see little tooth marks. Um, they do love aquatic plants and they really like water lilies. Um, and again, some of the best times to see them are if you can get in a boat in Maine or places where they're very common and paddle around, you'll see them dipping their head into the water to bring up plants. Uh, oftentimes, so I saw one one time and I didn't have a camera, it had some of those plants hanging on its antlers. It was pretty, pretty cool looking. Um, one reason is, uh, it's believed one reason moose eat these plants is to get enough salt, uh, which is necessary for good health. And Maine has stopped putting salt on their roads because like porcupines and deer and some other animals, will go to the side of the road and start eating salt. Well, the moose would actually lie down beside the road and lick the salt. So now uh, Maine is using some other sorts of uh, things to uh, keep their roads safe and keep the moose off the roads and then limit the car collisions. Uh, the moose use only their bottom incisors uh, to chisel and scrape upwards and strip the bark off of trees. Um, and again, a, an evidence of them in the area, uh, plants and trees will be snipped off at a height, uh, you know, just about at least five feet or more. Um, so um, that's one way you can see this. And it's very evident, you know, in the winter, it's kind of fun like to go out into the woods and look for this stuff. And even, you know, it's fun now with the snow, although it's pretty crusty where I live. So the tracks are pretty hard to distinguish right now, but you know, the winter is the best time to look for animal sign. So here's a moose track. Uh, as you see, it's very large. Uh, whenever you're gonna go out and, uh, and wanna tell what a track is, you always need something to measure it with and you know take a photo or do a sketch if you can and then go back and look up and try to figure out what you saw. But you know, moose uh, tracks are probably one, and bear tracks are probably our most distinctive and deer 
tracks here in our state, you know, the easiest uh, to figure out. Uh, this is what moose uh, droppings look like. Uh, they can vary in size by their diet, you know, so sometimes they could be a little larger. Uh, it all depends on their diet. Uh, again, that's another way to identify when animals have been around. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see kind of uh, there's a, an SUV truck or a truck in the background, so you can see the size of that moose compared to that truck. And uh, they just, they don't look across the road before they go, they just, they just go. Uh, so here's some moose sounds, uh, quite interesting. This is a, this is a male uh, grunting. Trying to turn him off. Okay, he would stop. Here's another moose sound. That's a male moose trying to intimidate uh, another male. Uh, hold on, let me see. Do that one again. You wouldn't know that was a moose, huh? There's another one. I'm sorry, I think that's the same. <laughs> That's a few. I guess. Okay, sorry. I, sometimes those sounds just keep going. That last one was a female uh, calling uh, a mate. Uh, here's one of my Barkhamstead moose. I've seen uh, a few in, in uh, Barkhamstead. This I blew up a little, but this was a young uh, calf. Uh, and uh, one time I was in Scotland hiking, and I have a ring camera, and it went off, and there was this female moose that circled my house for two hours. So I called one of my, I texted a biologist friend because I was afraid it had brainworm, but it wasn't, you know, tilting or doing anything. And it kept looking back and turns out right at about the two hour mark, here comes a bull moose. And then she ran out into the woods. So we suspect that she had like a, a calf out there. Uh, so that was kind of cool to see. So, so that's what I have for moose. Uh, as I said, this is probably the best time of year to see them, even if you drive. Uh, just a minute, I'm going to try to find myself again. Um, even if you're out driving, uh, because uh, they do move around this time of year and it's a little easier to find them. Uh, so I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Hi, Jenny. I have two questions, or actually one. That that was in the chat box. It it asks, do you know if Great Mountain Forest in Norfolk and Canaan have a reproducing population of moose? Yes, I meant to mention that they've they've done a study and they have about thirty moose that go in and out of there, and so they do have breeding population there. In fact, uh, aside from Heartland, uh, and a lot of the moose in Heartland are on MDC property. Aside from Heartland, you know, Great Mountain Forest is probably a, a terrific place to see moose. Uh, you'll see them. You can see it. I mean, most people have seen them. I have seen them in the mornings, early. And I'm not saying they're not around at night, but for some reason, it, the success rate is better early morning. Uh, but yeah, that place they have. It's a beautiful place to hike. They've got roads going throughout there, so you could just go on the roads. Uh, uh, there's a trail near their um, their center there that goes right along a beaver marsh. So that's a good habitat to see the moose. Uh, but uh, also, you know, look for those uh, broken little uh, uh, tree limbs, uh, branches, and that's a good indication of where they might be. Uh, then I have something from uh, Ron Blanchard that says, excellent inf informative presentation with great photos. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Ron. Ron's a fellow Master Wildlife Conservation. Oh, so you did all right then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone else have questions? Well, thank you. And I encourage you to keep slow on those roads at night. I always do. I mean, like I had a friend in my car. It's like, why are you going so slow? I said, because I don't want to hit an animal. I just hadn't possibly, we don't know what happened. There was a deer at the top of my road, which is a kind of remote road. And some things had already started eating on it, but we don't know if it was hit or if something killed it at nighttime. But the deer, 
they can get along in the snow, but not as well, obviously, as a moose. But, um, you know, once the snow gets deep, it's tough for a lot of these animals. Like, um, you know, a bobcat is limited at about six inches of snow, unless it's snow like this right now, where I can even walk on top of it and not sink in, uh, you know, just depending on where you are. So uh, snow presents a challenge, not just for us and our driveways, but also for our wildlife. So I wanted to tell everyone that we are going to have another Ginny Apple lecture in February on the 26th at two o'clock Zoom pr presentation. And this one will be on owls, which is uh, going to be very exciting. It will be in our newsletter and we'll have it on Facebook and elsewhere. But I just thought I'd give people the heads up on that. And thanks everybody for showing up today. Uh, and uh, like I said, this to me, I love autumn and winter hiking, but even if you don't hike, there's a lot of parks around, you know, get those yak tracks, things that, you know, they stretch and go on the bottom of your shoes and just go walking out, like particularly after snow. I mean, there's a million things you can see. And uh, like right now, um, once this, you get a snow cover, you can go out if you want to get a game cam. Those things don't cost much anymore. And they're a lot of fun to have. You put them about waist high out in the woods and Right now you can go and see where all the critters are crossing, you know, that's, and then you'll know that that's a good active area to, to put a game cam. And then when you bring that card, if you don't have a wireless, if you bring that card inside, it's amazing to see what came by that you had no idea. Uh, I think I told you before, we've had a lot more animal sightings since COVID because guess what? People are sitting in their houses, listening, looking around. So uh, we've had people are like, I didn't know we had fox here, or I didn't know we had bobcat here, but uh, you know it's been a great time for that. At least there's one advantage to to COVID there, you know. And but uh, a lot more animals have been seen because people are in their house and looking outside. So anyway, thank you. And uh, all right, thank you. Uh, and everyone, thank you, Jenny. Uh, thanks for. For coming along and hopefully we'll see you february 26th at two o'clock and you can learn about owls and everybody thanks again everyone i'm gonna thanks, jenny. turn everything off everybody stay well please okay you too jenny all right bye-bye bye thank you